Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Prepare Your Lab for Flu Season with Multiplex PCR. I am Antonina Salcedo of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, please visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. Now I'd like to welcome our speakers, Dr. Peter Freib and Lauren Miller. For a complete biography on today's speakers, please click their names in the presenter window at the top right of your screen. Lauren, you may now begin your presentation. This talk will be reviewing this year's viral respiratory infections from an epidemiological perspective. I'll start with a brief update on the current COVID-19 situation and some important considerations for preparing for this winter season. I'll introduce some of the common respiratory viruses before discussing their clinical management and the importance of diagnostic testing. I'll leave you with a final note on multiplex PCR technology before handing things off to our next speaker. Our first topic is a brief update on COVID-19. It's been over two and a half years since the first reported case, and today the pandemic is still considered a global emergency with high circulation worldwide. Currently, Omicron continues to dominate the globe with BA5 Omicron lineage reflected in 90% of reported sequences. Future waves of infection are expected from different subvariants of Omicron, if not a different variant entirely. That being said, we're at a point now where future waves of infection don't necessarily translate into future waves of death. Today, we're equipped with the knowledge and the tools we need, such as vaccinations, antivirals, and case management protocols, to effectively prevent transmission and severe disease. So now that we have these tools and infrastructure in place, how do countries prioritize their policies when we seem to be slowly transitioning from pandemic to endemic, but still face the risk of new variants and future surges? To assist these national and global efforts, the World Health Organization released six policy briefs outlining essential actions that policymakers can implement. And according to their recommendations, testing systems and strategies currently strive to meet three main objectives. One, testing should enable timely and appropriate clinical management. Two, testing data should inform epidemiological trends, which can help direct isolation protocols and public health and social measures. And three, testing strategies should track the circulation and evolution of the virus to detect increases in incidence and emergence of variants. Tracking and trending disease circulation is important for monitoring existing respiratory viruses. Interestingly, when looking at these epidemiological patterns in relation to the timeline of the COVID-19 pandemic, you can clearly see what a profound impact the pandemic has had on the circulation of viruses such as RSV and flu. In the EU, RSV was significantly reduced during the winter of 2020 with an unusually high off-season peak during the spring and summer wave of 2021. The seasonal flu was virtually non-existent in 2021 with a smaller and somewhat delayed peak last winter, causing some concern from experts for what this winter would look like. These trends give us a lot of information on how non-pharmaceutical interventions such as shutdowns and school closures affect overall transmission rates. Parainfluenza viruses, meningomaviruses, human coronaviruses, and adenoviruses all show significant reduction in their circulation patterns throughout the pandemic. In general, we can see that public health measures effectively reduce transmission of respiratory viral disease, but this also decreases community levels of immunity. Interactions between the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the other endemic viruses, whether competitive or cooperative, are very complex and might also significantly impact the infection dynamics. Given all the information we've just discussed, there are really three main considerations when it comes to preparing for this year's winter. First, we all know how unpredictable COVID-19 can be when it comes to new variants, but experts are predicting waves of infection by existing strains this winter. Second, as public health measures decrease and travel increases, higher influenza peaks are predicted. Record high influenza activity in the Southern Hemisphere this year could very well indicate higher influenza rates for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. And finally, the co-circulating respiratory viruses further complicate the situation. Based on observed epidemiological shifts, 
we've seen that easing social distancing and other measures can lead to surges in other infections. These respiratory infections can be exacerbated by decreased population immunity due to the lower exposure. At the end of the day, understanding these respiratory infections, how they present, how they're diagnosed, and how they're treated will very likely be crucial to managing this year's winter season. Respiratory infections are among the leading causes of death and burden of disease worldwide. They can affect the upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract, or both. Respiratory infections are typically classified according to syndrome, so the common cold, croup, bronchitis, pneumonia, etc. This method of classifying and treating a respiratory infection based on syndrome alone is usually sufficient for mild symptoms. So for a healthy, low-risk patient with common cold symptoms, you don't really need more information before sending them home to get rest and fluids. In other situations, though, a more accurate diagnosis can be more effective or even required for patient care. For example, if an immunocompromised or high-risk patient with asthma or COPD presents with pneumonia, you may very well need more information before you decide on the best course of action. For patients with severe disease requiring hospitalization or mechanical ventilation, an accurate diagnosis is critical for proper support of care and therapeutics. Another situation is during a local disease outbreak or say a global pandemic, in which case accurate diagnoses are required in order to inform isolation practices and precautions as well as public health and social measures. Unfortunately, accurately diagnosing respiratory infections can be particularly challenging. Many respiratory illnesses have very similar and often overlapping symptoms, and patients can be asymptomatic or have mild, moderate, or severe disease. Symptoms can vary depending on a number of factors, the causative agent, the specific strain, co-infection, immunity, and general health. And to make it even more challenging, respiratory syndromes such as pneumonia or the common cold can actually be caused by a number of different pathogens. Since trying to work your way backwards based on symptomology just isn't feasible, pathogen detection and differentiation is key to understanding respiratory infections while caring for patients with severe diseases, those at higher risk, or during disease outbreak. So what are these specific pathogens we're talking about here? First, there is of course SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 can cause the symptoms listed here to the right, as well as long COVID symptoms such as fatigue, depression, or difficulty concentrating. A number of vaccines have been authorized for use in the EU, which are highly protective against severe diseases, hospitalization, and death. This virus evolves quickly and rapidly, making it necessary to adapt the vaccine to match circulating variants, and these are provided as boosters. Currently, a number of antivirals and other treatments are authorized for use in the EU for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. Next, we have our influenza virus. Influenza A and B cause the seasonal flu, with most cases presenting as asymptomatic or mild, but severe illness can occur, especially in elderly patients, children under five years old, or those with chronic medical conditions. Influenza viruses are also prone to mutation, with antigenic drifts and shifts making it necessary to develop a new vaccine each year. Antivirals are available and recommended for those at risk for developing more serious complications. Respiratory syncytial virus is a leading cause of respiratory diseases globally, causing more than 3 million hospitalizations and over 59,000 in-hospital deaths in children under 5 years old. There is no vaccine for RSV, but two antivirals are approved for use in the EU. The monoclonal antibody palavizumab does not treat symptoms, but is used to prevent RSV infection in certain high-risk infants. Ribavirin may be considered for severely immunocompromised patients with lower respiratory tract infection. Adenoviruses typically cause mild cold or flu-like illness. More than 50 types of adenoviruses can cause infections in humans, most of which are respiratory illnesses from the common cold to pneumonia, croup, or bronchitis. People with weakened immune systems are at higher risk for developing severe illness, but as of now there is no specific treatment or authorized vaccine for adenovirus infection. Human meninumavirus is a relatively recently identified pathogen, although it's been thought to have been circulating for more than 50 years. HMPV can cause respiratory disease in people of all ages, but especially among young children, older adults, or those with weakened immune systems. The human rhinoviruses are actually now classified as being in the enterovirus genus. Originally, rhinoviruses were assigned to their own genus since disease presentation was notably different, but with the advent of sequencing-based classification methods, it was shown that human rhinoviruses are actually extremely structurally similar to enteroviruses. Human rhinoviruses are the primary causative agent of the common cold. This infection is usually mild and self-limiting, but it can be associated with bronchiolitis in infants, pneumonia, and the immunosuppressed. 
It can also exacerbate pre-existing pulmonary conditions like asthma or COPD. Enteroviruses affect millions of people worldwide every year. We're all familiar with the polio enterovirus, but there are also 81 non-polio enteroviruses, EVD68 being the one that typically causes respiratory illness. Most patients are asymptomatic or have only mild cold symptoms, but children with asthma are particularly at risk for severe symptoms from EVD68 infection. Human parainfluenza viruses, or HPIVs, commonly infect infants, young children, older adults, as well as those with weakened immune systems. HPIV 1 and 2 cause upper and lower respiratory illness and mild cold-like symptoms. HPIV 1 is the most common causative agent for croup in children. HPIV-3 is more often associated with bronchiolitis, bronchitis, and pneumonia, while HPIV-4 is recognized less often but may cause mild to severe respiratory illness. With all of these different viral pathogens associated with very similar symptoms, it's easy to see how challenging it would be to make an accurate diagnosis based on the clinical presentation alone. Pathogens are often associated with characteristic clinical manifestations. So for example, the most common cause of influenza-like illnesses is influenza virus. The most common cause of croup is HPIV, while bronchiolitis is most commonly caused by RSV. The common cold is commonly caused by rhinoviruses as well as coronaviruses. And pneumonia is usually caused by coronaviruses, influenza viruses, RSV, and adenoviruses. In many cases, though, these respiratory syndromes can actually cause by a number of different pathogens. So the clinical signs and symptoms of an acute respiratory tract infection are not necessarily pathogen specific. An accurate diagnosis, therefore, relies on accurate pathogen detection. Diagnostic PCR testing is considered the gold standard for pathogen detection. In PCR, genetic material is amplified for the detection of specific and targeted organisms. The superior sensitivity of PCR can detect low pathogen loads, leading to accurate results early on in the infection. Diagnostic respiratory testing allows a clinician to identify the causative pathogen and from there direct the course of treatment. This can be critical for high-risk patients or those with severe disease. Diagnostic testing also supports antimicrobial stewardship and informs patient management decisions such as hospitalization, isolation, and follow-up. For example, if a patient with severe disease comes in and is diagnosed with COVID-19, they should have access to oxygen therapy, oral or intravenous corticosteroids, or other targeted treatments. Treatment for patients infected with influenza is also specific to that virus and is recommended within the first 48 hours of onset of illness. Infants and toddlers diagnosed with RSV bronchiolitis can be treated with barbavirin. For these situations, accurate detection and identification of pathogens is truly at the core of treatment. Accurate diagnoses also supports antimicrobial stewardship. Antimicrobial resistance occurs when bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites mutate over time and no longer respond to medicines. AMR is a serious global risk, resulting in over 1 million deaths every year. This crisis is responsible for a huge portion of disease burden, and an infection with these resistant organisms can be severe. Despite the gravity of the situation, antibiotics are often prescribed without a definitive diagnosis. During the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, widespread overuse of antibiotics was observed for about 70% of patients, despite the fact that only roughly 7% of COVID-19 patients were found to actually have the secondary bacterial infection. So diagnostic testing can help distinguish viral from bacterial infections and lower the risk of unnecessarily prescribed antibiotics when coupled with good antimicrobial stewardship. So we see the importance of accurately diagnosing and differentiating between these viral pathogens, but running multiple tests on each patient can be difficult and time consuming. Multiplex PCR technology simultaneously differentiates respiratory diseases using primer and probe sets that cover multiple targets. Combining specific dyes associated with each virus in a single reaction well makes distinguishing infections much easier and can help physicians choose the appropriate treatments. Multiplex testing is critical when many infectious disease patients present with similar symptoms. The COVID-19 pandemic stressed the importance of making effective molecular diagnostics accessible. The global health response to COVID-19 prioritized the implementation of this infrastructure, establishing PCR systems, which can now be used to address an array of infectious diseases. Multiplex PCR can help detect co-infections, increase the likelihood of an early diagnosis, effectively identify and contain potential outbreaks, and support clinical research and epidemiology. At the end of the day, there are so many advantages using this multiplex PCR testing approach. 
PCR is highly accurate. With high sensitivity and specificity, accurate detections can be made even in the early stages of infections for samples with low viral loads. And unlike cell culture, PCR doesn't rely on viable organisms for detection. Multiplex PCR has fast turnaround times with low hands-on time. Rapid detection of respiratory viruses can cut down a patient's time spent in hospital or in isolation. Testing a large number of targets per sample increases throughput and decreases reagent use. Multiplex PCR is efficient and scalable. Integrate and add to your molecular testing menu, expand disease state testing without increasing costs, and integrate with other automated laboratory solutions. Multiplex PCR can detect co-infections, as well as differentiate between viral subtypes, such as flu A and flu B. Multi-target designs can even compensate for known emerging variants. So at the end of the day, multiplexing streamlines the laboratory workflow while accelerating and improving patient diagnoses. Thank you, Lauren. Now that brings us to our first poll question for our audience. Are you currently testing for respiratory pathogens other than COVID-19? Yes or no? We will give you a moment to answer as I repeat the question. Are you currently testing for respiratory pathogens other than COVID-19? Yes or no? Now for our next question. Do you want more information about the solutions in this presentation? Yes or no? We'll give you a moment to answer as I repeat the question. Do you want more information about the solutions in this presentation? Thank you to the audience for your participation. Now I'd like to pass it over to our second speaker, Dr. Peter Freebie, for his presentation. Thank you, Lauren, for this very detailed and informative overview of viral respiratory pathogens and for highlighting the advantages of using PCR testing. In the next 20 minutes or so, I will introduce you to our TACPAS molecular respiratory testing solutions, which utilize multiplex PCR. I will start by giving an overview of our molecular solutions and introduce you to the TACPAS COVID-19 flu AB RSV combo kit, which you may already be familiar with. I will also introduce you to our latest addition, the TACPAS respiratory select panel. I will then walk you through the workflow of both in vitro diagnostic assays. And if you have used any of our COVID-19 tests in the past, the workflow will feel very familiar. I will finish by highlighting the performance characteristics of both tests, and then we will open the session for Q&A. The, the TACPAS COVID-19 flu A, B, RSV combo kit can, in a single test, detect and differentiate between SARS coronavirus 2, influenza AB, and RSV. It is designed to be scalable, though the throughput can be increased to meet the demand. The test is highly sensitive and specific for its viral targets, and it comes with our pathogen interpretive software that will analyze all the data and generate a report with the result for each specimen. We offer the TACPAS COVID-19 flu AB RSV combo kit in a 1000 reaction per kit configuration. And the kit includes all the primers and probes to detect the viral targets and the MS2 process control. The MS2 phage process control is included in the kit and it needs to be added to each sample prior to sample preparation. This externally added process control helps to directly monitor assay performance of each sample. Talking about controls, the kit includes a positive control, 
and the PCR is run using the TACPAS one-step multiplex master mix. The TACPAS Respiratory Viral Select panel is our latest addition and can detect five common respiratory viruses in a single test. It targets adenovirus, human metanumovirus, rhinovirus enterovirus, it does not differentiate between the two, and parainfluenza virus 1, 2, 3, and 4, again undifferentiated. The test is designed to provide, to provide results of up to 94 samples in as little as two hours, starting with nucleic acid. It complements our TACPAS COVID-19 flu A, B, RSV combo kit, and both tests can be run on the Applied Biosystems Quant Studio 5 PCR instrument. The TACPAS Respiratory Virus Select panel also comes with our pathogen interpretive software that will analyze all the data and prepare a report with all the results. We offer the TACPAS Respiratory Virus Select panel in a 200 reaction per kit configuration. And again, the kit includes all the primers and probes to detect the viral targets and the RNAs P process control. The RNAs P process control is sample derived and does not need to be externally added. Monitoring RNAs P helps to ensure sample integrity and assay performance for each specimen. A positive control is included in the kit and the PCR is run using the TACPAS one-step respiratory master mix. Okay, now that I've introduced you to our respiratory testing solutions, let me walk you through the workflow. This slide shows a bird's eye view of the workflow and I will discuss each step in more detail. But just to give you a high level overview, step one is receiving samples. Step two is sample preparation and nucleic acid extraction. Step three is setting up and running the PCR. And in step four, the pathogen interpretive software analyzes the data and creates a report with the results. Okay, now let's take a closer look at each of the steps. Both assays support nasopharyngeal swab samples collected by a healthcare professional. The samples are then sent to the clinical testing laboratory. The second step is sample preparation carried out at the clinical laboratory. This is done using our Kingfisher Flex purification system together with our MagMax viral pathogen 2 nucleic acid isolation kit. The Kingfisher allows automated sample preparation in 96 well format. This extraction system is required for the TACPAS Respiratory Virus Select Panel and recommended for the TACPAS COVID-19 Flu AB RSV Combo Kit. The extracted sample is then used to set up and run the PCR using the TACPAS Respiratory Virus Select Panel or the TACPAS COVID-19 Flu AB RSV Combo Kit. Both assays can be run on the Quant Studio 5 real time PCR system in 96 well format. The TACPAS COVID 19 flu AB RSV combo kit also supports the use of the Quant Studio 7 flex real time PC PCR system for the use of 384 well plates. This allows to upscale throughput if the need arises. The 7500 fast real time PCR instrument is also supported. For the TACPAS Respiratory Viral Select Panel, the use of the Quant Studio 5 and Quant Studio 5 DX real time PCR system is authorized. Once the PCR run is done, the pathogen interpretive software analyzes the data and generates a report with the results for each sample. The software monitors all, that all the controls performed correctly. It monitors the positive and negative controls as well as the process control in each sample. And of course, the results can be exported to allow integration into your laboratory information system.
Okay, now that you know the workflow, I want to highlight the performance of our tests. I will start with the TACPAS COVID-19 Flu AB RSV Combo Kit. The limit of detection highlights the analytical sensitivity of our test. It reflects the lowest concentration that is detected in 95% of the testings. We determined the limit of detection for each of the vial targets, and it is expressed here as TCID50 per ml in the middle column. TCID50 stands for Tissue Culture Infectious Dose 50, and it is a measure for infectious viral concentration. For SARS coronavirus 2, the limit of detection is 8.2 times 10 to the minus 3 TCID50 per ml. And just to give you a reference, we use titer around 10 to the 6 TCID50 per ml for the high titer range, though the titer shown here are extremely low. We also determined the corresponding genome copy equivalent, short GCE, which for SARS coronavirus 2 is 50 GCE per ml, shown here to the right in the table. The limit of detection for influenza AB is between 350 and 1250 GCE per ml, depending on the strain. And the limit of detection for RSV is 200 GCE per ml. The TACPAS COVID-19 flu AB RSV Combo Kit is a highly sensitive test that can detect even low viral titers. We also performed a lot of wet lab testing to demonstrate that our assay detect different strains and isolates. What I really want to highlight on this slide is that we tested multiple H3N2 isolates and successfully detected all of them. I also want to emphasize that our test can detect a recently reported H3N2 strain with a genetic drift in the matrix gene. Detection of H3N2 is likely of importance as this strain was the most dominant strain in the southern hemisphere. We also tested and detected different influenza B lineages shown at the lower part of this slide. And we tested different RSVA and RSVB isolates and detected all of them successfully, shown on this slide. Now, the TACPAS COVID-19 flu AB RSV Combo Kit is a multiplex PCR assay, meaning that in a single reaction, the kit can detect and differentiate between SARS coronavirus 2, flu AB, and RSV. To ensure that there is no competitive interference, we performed a study in which we added one virus at a very high concentration, about 10 to the 6 copies per reaction, and the second virus at a very low concentration, just a few hundred copies per reaction. To the left, you see the amplification curves for samples having a high flu titer and a very low SARS coronavirus 2 titer. The amplification curve for the flu target is shown in red and it's labeled flu high. The amplification curve for SARS coronavirus 2 is shown in green and it's labeled COVID low. As you can see, both targets are amplified and detected. The MS2 process control is also amplified and detected. The curve is shown here in black. To the right, you see amplification curves from samples with a high RSV titer and a low flu titer. And again, both targets are successfully amplified and detected. The amplification curve for RSV is shown in blue, and the amplification curve for flu is shown in red. The MS2 process control is shown in black again. To conclude, the TACPAS COVID-19 flu AB RSV combo kit is highly accurate in detecting co-infection and it is not impacted by high to low titer ratios. Last but not least, we performed a clinical evaluation study in which we tested retrospective samples with our TACPAS COVID-19 flu AB RSV combo kit against a CEIVD marked comparator. The results are summarized in this table. 
In the middle column, you can see the positive percent agreement short PPA. This number reflects the percentage of samples that tested positive for the respective target using our assay in relation to the comparator. As you can see, we obtained 100% or very close to 100% for all the three viral targets. To the right, you see the negative percent agreement, which reflects the percentage of samples that tested negative for its respective target with our assay in relation to the comparator. And again, we have a very close alignment. So overall, this study demonstrates the excellent clinical performance of the TACPAS COVID-19 flu AB RSV combo kit. Okay, now let me introduce you to the performance of our TACPAS respiratory viral select panel. And again, I will start with the limit of detection to show you just how sensitive our test is. We tested different strains of adenovirus, parainfluenza virus 1, 2, 3, and 4, human metanumovirus, enterovirus, and rhinovirus. The limit of detection is shown in the middle column, expressed as TCID50 per ml. And just as a reminder, TCID50 stands for tissue culture infectious dose 50, and it is a measure for infectious viral concentration. The numbers we obtained are very low, and in summary, the TACPAS Respiratory Virus Select Panel is a highly sensitive test. We performed an in silico inclusivity analysis to ensure that the test can detect different isolates of the targeted viruses. We analyzed over 1,100 adenovirus sequences, over 200 human metanumovirus sequences, over 500 parainfluenza, over 4,000 entero, and over 1,400 rhinovirus sequences. And our analysis found that we cover almost 100% of the analyzed sequence, the percentage as shown in the right column. As with our TACPAS COVID-19 flu ABRSV combo kit, the TACPAS Respiratory Virus Select Panel is also a multiplex PCR assay that, in a single test, can detect and differentiate multiple viral targets. To demonstrate its ability to detect co-infection even with different titer ratios, we tested samples containing one virus at a very high concentration, above 10 to the 4 TCID50 per ml, and the second virus at a very low concentration around three times its limit of detection. Our requirement was that the TACPAS Respiratory Virus Select Panel detects both viruses in all tested samples, and that is exactly what our results looked like. Both viruses were detected in all 18 combinations tested. With other words, we did not observe competitive interference for any of the tested combinations. To ensure that there is no cross-reactivity, we perform wet lab studi studies using high concentration for all the organisms listed in this table. Viral concentrations were usually above 10 to the 5 TCID50 or over, or over 10 to the 6 CFU per ml for bacteria. CFU stands for colony forming units and it's a measure of bacterial concentration. Instead of going through each of the organisms tested, let me just give you the study results. We did not see any cross-reactivity. The TACPAS Respiratory Virus Select Panel is highly specific for its targets. We also performed a precision study to demonstrate that the test performs independent of the laboratory, the operator, or the time of testing. In this study, we tested samples either at a low or moderate viral titer at three different laboratories and two different operators per laboratory. Each operator tested all three samples on five different days. So overall, we performed a lot of tests and the column that highlights the result is the percent agreement column in this table, which is the second from the right. As you can see, we had 100% agreement between 
all tests, all labs, all operators, and all days. In our clinical validation study, we included a total of 350 samples that we tested using our TACPAS Respiratory Viral Select Panel and the Luminex NX Tech Respiratory Pathogen Panel, which is CIVD marked, as a comparator. Our study design had any sample with discordant results tested with the BioFire Respiratory 2.1 Panel as a resolver method. The resolver determines the true value of a sample. Finally, having true positive and negative values for each sample, we determine the clinical sensitivity and the clinical specificity for our TACPAS Respiratory Viral Select Panel. The results of the clinical study are summarized in this table. To the left, you see the viral target with the clinical sensitivity always the first upper entry and the specificity just below. For example, for adenovirus, we observed a sens clinical sensitivity of 100% and a clinical specificity of 99.4%. Overall, we had very good agreement with the true values of each sample in many cases at 100% clinical sensitivity or clinical specificity or close to 100%. This study demonstrates the excellent clinical performance of the TACPAS Respiratory Viral Select Panel. So let me summarize. We now offer the TACPAS COVID-19 Flu AB RSV Combo Kit and the TACPAS Respiratory Viral Select Panel to provide an all-around solution for testing and differentiating between some of the most common respiratory viruses. The TACPAS COVID-19 Flu AB RSV Combo Kit can detect and differentiate between sars cov 2 Flu AB and RSV. The TACPAS Respiratory Viral Select Panel can detect and differentiate between adenovirus, human metanumovirus, rhinovirus enterovirus, and para-influenza virus 1 to 4. You can add one or both kits to increase your molecular testing menu. This concludes our webinar presentation. Thank you for attending and we can now welcome questions. Thank you, Peter. We will now ask the audience a couple more polling questions. Are you thinking of adding targets to your molecular type testing menu? Yes or no? I'll give you a moment to answer as I repeat the question. Are you thinking of adding targets to your molecular testing menu? Yes or no? And as a reminder, we'll have some Q&A right after this. Now for our last poll question. Do you want more information about the solutions in this presentation? Yes or no? I'll give you another moment to answer. Do you want more information about the solutions in this presentation? Yes or no? All right. Thank you to the audience for your participation and thank you, Peter and Lauren, for your informative presentations. We'll now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question um, for Peter, the TACPATH Respiratory Viral Select Panel says it targets rhinovirus and, and, and enterovirus undifferentiated. What does this mean and why is it done this way? 
So yes, the uh, TugPass Respiratory Virus Select Panel does target rhinovirus and enterovirus in the same channel. Both viruses are very closely related. They're actually both part of the Piconaviridae day family. And to maximize the, the amount of viruses that we can target, we put both in the same channel. So that means that if a patient is positive with either enterovirus or rhinovirus, especially enterovirus D68, um, the results will be the patient is positive with rhinovirus slash enterovirus. So the results are not differentiated between those two viruses. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, another question here for Warren. How does PCR compare to classical culture and antigen-based methods? Um, yeah, so um, classical PCR culture-based methods for diagnosis and antigen tests and PCR tests, they all kind of have their place um, in the world of, you know, clinical diagnosis and evaluation. I guess antigen tests, you know, they're very uh, quick. So within approximately, you know, 15, 30 minutes, they can be used to very quickly test, you know, large numbers of people, screen. They're um, typically less sensitive than PCR, um, but the turnaround time can have a very positive impact. Um, so, you know, this reason antigen tests are usually used for screening nursing homes, dorms, you know, correctional facilities, homeless shelters, hospitals, kind of larger populations to quickly screen them to inform prevention and control measures um, and control transmission. Um, but because antigen tests test for, it depends on the level of virus that is in the starting sample. Um, there can be false you know, positives or false negatives. And um, it's not as sensitive as PCR. So PCR is definitely considered the gold standard for um, clinical diagnosis. And then when we think of cell culture, kind of these more traditional based methods, they can grow the bacteria, viruses, and fungi, um, but this kind of takes a long time. It can take a matter of days or weeks. Um, they're also relatively labor intensive and require um, a lot of training for technicians. Um, it can fail when you're trying to grow difficult to culture organisms like fastidious organisms. Um, so in in comparison to cell culture, you know, PCR and antigen testing are both far more sensitive, far faster. Um, the workflow is more uniform um, and it's a lot more accessible for laboratories. Um, so, you know, there's kind of a trade off for all all of these options. Um, but in general, I guess the main point is that PCR has much faster turnaround times, much higher sensitivity, higher specificity than cell culture. Um, and now it kind of opens the gateway for all of these new paths for physicians to take. So for example, syndromic panels, you know, they're offered as multi-pathogen assays that can detect co-infection in a single test. You can have custom ordered panels that are really strategically tailored and customized to meet a clinician's needs. And, you know, physicians now find themselves in a situation where they have this growing test menu where testing performed at clinical laboratories can use a wide variety of platforms, all with very, you know, straightforward and uniform workflows for, you know, accurate results. Um, I hope that answered the question. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, another question for you. We were warned of a twindemic last year, but it never came. What makes experts think COVID-19 and the flu will surge this winter? So the past two years, I think we've heard a lot of talk about this twindemic, which is basically, you know, experts warning against um, large surges in COVID infection as well as flu infection, you know, and kind of this overwhelming of the um, hospitals and healthcare providers because it's all kind of happening at the same time since flu is seasonal. And, you know, as we saw in the previous slides, since the public health measures and quarantine of the pandemic have kind of um, basically stopped <laughs> flu circulation for a couple of years while those public health measures were in place. Um, I think the, the worry was that once we start moving around and traveling and, you know, lifting these public health measures, we would all be sharing these germs that we just haven't been exposed to for a couple of years. Um, 
this didn't happen the last you know winter or two because we kept getting more <laughs> covid variants and covid infections and we didn't really ease up on covid restrictions as much as they predicted um so now it's kind of in full force again this winter since you know countries around the world are starting to lift these restrictions we are starting to travel more we're all starting to kind of go back to the things that we used to be doing um, so when you put all of that together, you know, we do know that COVID is expected to increase this year. Like we said in the presentation, you know, the new BQ1 sublineages and its offshoots will probably, um, you know, cause at least, you know, a relatively significant increase in cases. And at the same time, experts do anticipate a significant increase in flu cases this year. So, you know, since mask wearing and social distancing are less routine right now, um, it's it's likely. And a lot of places I know here in the U.S., we're already seeing a surge in flu cases compared to, you know, similar times in previous years. And the other thing is we can sometimes use the southern hemisphere to kind of predict what the flu will be like here in the northern hemisphere since their flu season happens first. And when we look at that for this year, you know, Australia has had the worst flu season they've had in five years um, so, you know, some experts are kind of looking at that information and predicting higher flu this year. Um, and then RSV, that's kind of the, the third virus that we're expecting. So we saw in, you know, my last slide how when RSV kind of had this giant um, increase last year, kind of off season, um, it's really showing how it's kind of making a comeback in the EU. And then here in the U.S., um, we've already detected a surge in cases of RSV that's kind of coinciding with COVID transmission and, um, you know, an earlier flu season. So um, that's, I guess that's what we mean when we say an expected uh, now triple demic. It's with the addition of RSV into the mix. Um, so I think that's, that's where kind of experts are looking at right now. Thank you, Lauren. A few questions for Peter now. Um, does the test detect all COVID-19 variants? Yes, uh, TACPAS COVID-19 flu ABSV combo kit does detect all COVID-19 variants, all subvariants of Omicrons, and we do monitor all new emerging variants and mutations and assess their potential to impact very closely to ensure that there is actually no impact on test performance. So our tests detect all variants of COVID-19, inclusive of all subvariants of Omicron. Thank you. And a follow up. Um, does the test differentiate between influenza A and B? The test does not differentiate between influenza A and B. And that's kind of a follow up on what Lauren just mentioned. We do actually expect a peak of COVID-19 flu and RSV this winter, or at least there is a risk that all three viruses will come up. We have seen some early warning signs. So instead of differentiating between influenza A and B, our test detects RSV on top of influenza and SARS coronavirus too. So it tests for all those three viruses in a single test. Thank you. Um, and another question for Lauren. Is it safe to get the COVID and flu vaccine at the same time? Um, yes, it was the short answer. Um, so they've um, conducted a lot of studies throughout the pandemic. Um, and the CDC has um, kind of some publications that are really interesting to look at. But throughout the pandemic, they've been testing the safety and efficacy of the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine, as well as the COVID boosters. Um, and, you know, the most that they noticed was uh, possibly slightly more increase in initial reactions like fatigue, headache, but, you know, it goes away very quickly. So the findings are generally consistent that um, there, there are no safety concerns with giving both vaccines at the same time. So, yes, absolutely. Perfect. Um, just last question here. What do we know about emerging COVID-19 variants such as BQ 1.1? Um, so... BQ1 and its sublineages and offshoots, yeah, they're they're making their appearance known now. Um, the uh, ECDC kind of projected last week that there will be uh, increased rates. Um, we'll definitely see increased cases of these sublineages this winter. Um, 
I think the European Center for Disease Prevention Control, they actually um, released, you know, preliminary laboratory studies that um, estimate transmission rates of these in cases of these this winter. Um, but according to the very, very limited study, um, it hasn't been associated with increased severity. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's spreading relatively quickly, but it still kind of makes up a small portion. So um, that's that's on the radar for this winter, but um, I think any other claim would be, um, I think we would just need more information, um, but that's, that's something to keep an eye on this winter for sure. Great, thank you, Peter and Lauren. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, not for me. Just thank you guys very much for tuning in. And um, yeah, have a great rest of your week. Yeah, and if you have any follow-up question, please feel free to contact us at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and we are happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you again, Peter Lauren, for your time today and your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I'd just like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with any one of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.